This video was brought to you by Brilliant. Anyone who's recently tried to buy a house in the US will know that the country's living through a pretty severe housing crisis. Now, housing was always pretty unaffordably expensive in certain coastal cities, looking at you, New York and San Francisco. But in the past decade or so, the housing crisis has spread to much of the rest of the US and prices have continued to rise even during the pandemic. So we thought that we'd do a video to take a look at the US's ongoing housing crisis. And we're going to do that by splitting this video into three parts. Firstly, we're going to take a look at the crisis today and why it is indeed a crisis. Secondly, we're going to take a look at how we got to this point and why the US stopped building enough houses. And thirdly, we're going to take a look at how the housing crisis might be fixed and why there's a reason for optimism here. So, on to the first part, the crisis itself. Put simply, there just aren't enough houses in America. A Freddie Mac report from 2019 estimated that the US is short some 3.79 million housing units, up from 1.65 million in 2012. And, well, it's basic economics that when demand outstrips supply, costs go up. Historically, the US's median multiple, which describes the relationship between the area's median wage and median house price, has hovered at between two and three, which means that the median house usually costs the equivalent to two or three years of the median wage. However, by the end of the pandemic, this had risen to five, which is described by analysts as severely unaffordable. This crisis has been especially acute in certain coastal areas. However, over the past decade or so, it's spread to even previously affordable areas. And most places in the US now require you to spend at least 40% of your income on housing in order to live there. And unsurprisingly, Americans have noticed this. Polling from October 2021 found that roughly half of Americans said that the availability and affordability of housing was a significant problem in their local community, up 10 percentage points from 2018. So you get the idea. A housing shortage has pushed up housing costs. But why does this actually constitute a crisis? The reason that the unaffordability of American housing constitutes a crisis is because high house prices are bad news for not just the prospective buyers, but for basically everyone. For starters, high and rising house prices entrench inequality by making already rich homeowners richer and pricing already poor renters out of perhaps the best investment available to them in modern America. A paper from 2017 found that zoning restrictions and high house prices have prevented people from moving within their state, which essentially segregated them into richer and poorer areas, reducing social mobility and exacerbating inequality. This housing crisis also exacerbates racial and generational inequality. The housing crisis has pushed African-American home ownership rates back to the levels they were in the 70s, and younger generations are now significantly less likely than their aged peers to own a home. And higher house prices also imply longer commutes, which cost the planet some 2.6 million tonnes of CO2 each year. Even if you don't care about the environment or inequality, stupendously high house prices are just bad news for the economy generally. For starters, it requires people hoarding their capital in housing, which is nowhere near as economically productive as other kinds of investment. Prohibitively high house pricing also prevents people from moving to productive cities, where they'd be able to create more value. A famous paper from 2009 estimated that if high productivity cities like New York and the San Francisco Bay Area had ideal planning laws which would allow more people to move there, then the US's total GDP would be 9% higher, which would mean nearly $9,000 more for the median American salary. And remember, this paper came out in 2009, so the figures would likely be even more extreme today. You get the idea then. The housing crisis is a crisis because it's bad news for both America's social fabric and its wider economy. So, on to the second part of the video. How did we get here? 
Well, the genealogy of America's housing crisis is much like that of any other developed country. It begins with a housing shortage created by some poorly crafted piece of legislation, which now pushes prices up. This encourages people to treat homes as speculative investments, pushing house prices up even higher, encouraging further speculation ad infinitum. These housing price rises are then protected by politicians because they want homeowners to vote for them. In America's case, the original cause of the shortage was zoning laws, but things got significantly worse after both 2008 and the pandemic. Now, zoning laws were introduced in the early 20th century in reaction to mass urbanization in America. Now, while zoning might make some sense in theory, planners are incentivized to limit housing because it keeps the current residents happy. And as such, the process is regularly hijacked by special interest groups. Anyway, while zoning laws might have been the original cause of the housing crisis, it was massively exacerbated by the Great Recession of 2008. As investors fled the housing market, finance for builders dried up. And as such, about 1.5 million workers left the industry, which has been in a labor shortage ever since. 2008 also ushered in the era of super low interest rates, which massively inflated housing demand by bringing down the cost of mortgages. Prices then jumped again during the pandemic, in part because remote workers realized that they wanted to live in different places but also because discretionary spending fell precipitously and Americans used their new savings in order to buy houses. However, institutional investors like asset managers and private equity firms also played a role in this. Institutional investors started getting involved in the housing market in earnest in 2008 when they saw an investment opportunity in falling home prices. This, in practice, continued into the subsequent decade, but hit a new peak over the pandemic. And in 2021, institutional investors accounted for nearly 25% of all single-family home sales. You get where we're going with this. The original sin of the American housing market is zoning, but the issue's been exacerbated by a whole load of other factors. Which brings us on to the third part of this video. How might it be fixed? Well, the main reason it hasn't been fixed so far is bad political incentives. Homeowners like rising house prices, and that's important because homeowners also constitute a majority of voters and are more likely to vote than renters. On top of that, zoning laws are normally decided by local politicians who just aren't that responsive to democratic pressures because well, no one knows who they are. However, there is reason for some optimism. For starters, the US is building more homes right now than at any other point since the 1970s. On top of that, it looks like voters and politicians are finally wising up to the costs of the housing crisis. The Biden administration published the Housing Supply Action Plan in May of this year, and there's currently a bipartisan bill going through Congress that would reward local communities that ease zoning restrictions or build denser housing. Finally, rising interest rates should bring down house prices by making mortgages more expensive and pushing the US into a recession, which is uh, a silver lining of sorts. Ultimately though, the economics of all of this and the issues with housing go deep, but hopefully there are changes afoot to make this situation better. It's pretty complicated though, and Honestly, when doesn't maths get pretty complicated? If you want to improve that for yourself, though, you should check out the courses over on Brilliant, because the world has never needed more smart thinkers. And Brilliant not only helps you brush up on the basics, but also leads you through university-level concepts like infinity, the history of maths, and the numbers behind neural networks. It's not just maths either. There's interactive courses on physics, computer science, and a whole variety of STEM topics. Plus, there's some incredibly fun content from your favorite YouTubers too, like Kurtz Gazette and a brand new course from our Nebula friends over at Real Engineering. So finish off the year by bettering yourself with Brilliant, where you'll find thousands of incredible courses where you'll learn by doing as well as discovering whole new ways of thinking. 
And better still, the first 200 people to sign up using our link in the description will get 20% off an annual premium subscription. Thanks for your support.